All right, so if you're just joining us um, and you haven't already done so, please go ahead and check your audio. And um, normally if you're experiencing audio trouble or you don't have a headset or speakers, you can call in. Um, but I know Tess has tried that a couple times and it's not working. I'm going to give you all the number again just in case. And if you want to try it, um, feel free. I don't know um, why it would not be working today. And Tess says, unfortunately, she's giving up and, she, and now she can't hear you. Uh, Earl, did you have a suggestion? No, just checking my uh, mic. Oh, my my yep. audio is fine. Yep, no worries. Okay. I'm going to just type Tess a note here real quick. Um, so that she can um, join us. All right. Let me find my slides. Here we go. All right, so this is the last Ignis of the season. So I do thank you for joining us. So welcome to our final webinar. And um, I'm thrilled to have you all join us today. Ignis is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, is to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. And this series is brought to you by the SBCTC Office of eLearning and Open Education. My name is Alyssa Sells, and I will be your host today. Our presenter today is Christy Fierro from Tacoma Community College. And our topic today is how to engage students by using open pedagogy and universal design for learning principles for assignment design. So a big thank you to Christy for sharing her knowledge and her expertise with us this afternoon. As a reminder, all of our webinars are captioned this season, and thank you to a la carte for their real-time captioning services, and Bonnie's joining us from a la carte today, so um, give a shout out to Bonnie, she does a great job. To activate the captions, just click on the CC button in the top right corner of the audio video panel, or you can use Control F8 to open and Control W to close the captioning window. You'll also find a list of collaborate keyboard shortcuts located in the help menu, or you can also access them online, and I'm going to put those links for you um, into the chat here. And then I'm also going to give you a link to the accessibility guide for Collaborate, just in case um, you need that. So uh, we, we do record these webinars, and you will be able to access the recording link on the ATL blog, and I'm going to give you that link as well. And um, feel free to um, share this link out with friends, um, colleagues that may have um, missed this opportunity to um, join us today. And I inadvertently forgot to um, advance the slides when I was speaking. So we're a few slides behind here. I got so excited about what I was talking about. So here's where you can find the recording on the ATL blog. And then we're going to take just a minute to talk about the meeting interface. Normally, we start the IGNIS webinars by running through some of the Collaborate tools. And we're going to do that now. And then I'm going to turn it over to Christy. I'm going to move through uh, the interface slides fairly quickly because we're only going to be using two features today, and those are chat and polling. And um, Christy has asked that you hold your questions and comments to the end, but please do type them into the chat as she's speaking, and we will revisit them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. All right, so here we go. Here are some participant tools for you. And there are emoticons. There's um, a button to step away. You can raise your hand if you would like to speak. We'll call on you. There's a polling tool, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in an upcoming slide, and we are going to use that today. Um, and then when you're speaking, make sure that that little blue microphone displays. That means your talk is on. And then when you're finished, if you would please just turn your talk button off, um, that would be great. All right, so we are going to start with a practice poll, just because we are going to do some polls during um, the webinar today. So um, if you will find that little check mark 
in the polling tools and answer this question, do you struggle getting students to engage in classwork? And you can just give us a green check mark for yes or an X for no and um, go ahead and practice doing that. I'll give you just a second to do that and then we'll publish the results to the window here. Let me see here. Let me just publish those. Okay, hopefully everybody's had a chance to participate. Okay, so um, some of you, quite a few of you, 52% said um, yes, you do have um, a struggle sometimes getting students to engage in their classwork. So, um, Christy, do you have any comments on the poll before we go on? It looks like it's working great. I'm excited to talk more about this. Yeah, and then just one thing I'd like to mention is um, I'm going to be changing the polling tool from a check mark to the letter A because um, Christie's polls are set up to be A, B, C, D. So the next time we do a poll, you're going to be clicking um, a letter instead of a check mark, but um, it'll be located in the exact same place. So I will um, be changing that shortly. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Christy now and um, take it away, Christy. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I want to start with a big thank you. I know it's an incredibly busy time of the season, although I'm, I'm not sure when is a not busy time for such innovative colleagues, but I really value and respect your time, and, and it's an honor that you've joined us here today. I want to put some of the stories that we're going to tell in context. Four years ago, I was blessed to start teaching as an adjunct at Tacoma Community College. Before that, I was teaching at Murray State University in Murray, Kentucky. And then about a year ago, I was fortunate to be invited to join the e-learning team and transition into a role of instructional designer and coordinating our open education resources program. But the, I still adjunct a class each quarter to try out things in the classroom. Here at TCC, we embrace discovery. And it helps to be collaborating with the students and, and I've, my assignments have become better because of the students, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. A big part of this is blending the open pedagogy and the universal design for learning. So let's briefly review those. OER, we have a three-pronged definition that we're using in the state of Washington. Open education resources we often think of as digital, but they can be on paper. But we're talking about resources that are in the creative, have a Creative Commons license or are in the public domain. And most importantly, something that you have permission to retain and freely use and repurpose. So let's get familiar with who's in the audience and do a quick poll on how familiar with you, how, how familiar you are with the OER. That'll help us know how much time to spend so go ahead and use the polling tool that we practiced with earlier and answer Christy's polling question here. We have this set up as an A, B, C, or D. We'll give you just another minute to do that, and then I will, well, not a full minute, but I'll publish those here shortly. Okay, Christy, there's your responses. Oh, and then to that, um, add, um, Dawn is in her, in Bellingham in their e-learning lab, and they have three folks in there, so she's got a, a B answer, a C answer, and a D answer, so um, what you see up on the screen is just slightly higher than um, what it's showing. This is a great group that to collaborate with, and to see that we have some that are here that are new, thank you, and then we have some gurus in the house. So for those that are new or still newish to OER, our state board actually has a fantastic class on how to use open education resources. The registration will soon be open for the July section. The faculty at TCC that have taken this course have commented they consider it should be a prerequisite to teaching. So I would encourage you to bookmark the WAL page. And that course will really help you get grounded and open and dive deeper. 
Another resource is David Riley's blog. David is, is very philosophical and, and, and has really beautiful writing. And catching up on the blogs that are archived can really help you. And so David is the one who first coined the term open pedagogy with the definition that we've embraced at Tacoma Community College as a resource that lives beyond the quarter and gives value to the world. A lot of people first think about OER as just replacing a textbook. David cautions us that if we just replace the tech, an expensive textbook with something that's free or more affordable for students, he describes that as driving an airplane down the road. An airplane can drive down the road if it's, my slides are stuck, Alyssa. An airplane can drive down the road if it, the road is wide enough, but it, <laughs> that's not what we use airplanes for. That's not what it was meant to do. But it just we need to dive deeper and think about replacing the disposable assignment. So this is the way we're going to engage students, by giving them some choice. A big part of universal design for learning is embracing being flexible. And it adds a lot of creativity in the classroom. So now let's pause and talk about how familiar you are with the UDL. We'll do our next yep. poll. Go ahead and use the polling tools to answer this question. We'll give you just another few seconds to do that, and then I'll go ahead and publish the poll to the whiteboard for us. All right, there are your results, Christy. All right. Oh, another great mixture. I often use the CAST website when I'm wanting to dive deeper. Let's just do a brief review to all be on the same page. There's, there are components like flexibility and accessibility built in, and there are three main tiers of the universal design for learning. The first one meaning multiple means of engagement. We're going to find some creative ways to stimulate the interest and the motivation for the learning. Then in the second tier, we want multiple ways that students can express what they've learned. Everyone doesn't have to take the same test. Often in the projects we're going to talk about, the students were not even doing their assessment in a classroom. We want to provide more than one way for students to demonstrate what they've learned. Then the third tier is multiple ways of presenting the content. So in the projects we're going to talk about, often the students were creating content that was provided in future sections of the course. So you if you kind of put it all together in one visual and think about that plane lifting up and taking off, you'll see how when we talk about these projects how the, you, the Open Education Resources Project engaged the student on another level because it was voluntary. It was their choice. So they were obviously engaged because these are, we're going to talk about projects that they weren't required to do. The assessments often were not even in the classroom. The students were using or being able to demonstrate what they have learned in a very creative way. And most often, they were then create, use, putting those in videos or text that are being used in future courses. So I, as I started looking into this deeper, I'm like, wow, open pedagogy and UDL come together as a perfect combination. So let's talk about some, <laughs> I like Caitlin's comment, make it so. Let's talk about some, some ways to help set you up for success. Number one, for these projects to work in the classroom, you really need to be able to establish some trust. I mentioned that my teaching started at Murray State University in Murray, Kentucky, and they're on a semester 16-week si uh, semester system. Then I started teaching in Washington on a quarter system. And at first, one of my biggest stresses was, how am I going to fit 16 weeks of content into 10 weeks that then can become an eight-week summer. So before my training in universal design for learning, I skipped over a lot of the community building pieces, thinking we didn't have time for them. And in my UDL training, I learned that that was a big mistake. 
the students needed to see what my pedagogical style is. If they need to be able to build a trust relationship with me to really be able to be creative in suggesting what they're going to do on their assignments as they start building them. So one of my biggest pieces of advice is don't skip over the community building section. For this to really work on the third tier where they're providing content for future classes, you're also going to need to show them the licenses and suggest that they use the licenses on their work so that you can show them the future classes. I've never required this. I've always just suggested it. But if you take the time to explain the philosophy behind it, the students often embrace the idea. I still have some students, uh, some assignments that I don't have examples for the students. And even just last quarter, a student said, can you show me an example of this assignment? And I said, well, I can, I can talk to you some more about the assignment. And if you'll share yours with the Creative Commons license, I will have an example next time. The students like getting involved and going back to that, getting rid of the disposable assignment. They become more motivated and engaged when they see that this is going to live beyond the quarter. And you'll hear from uh, a student at the end speaking to that directly. We don't have time to dive into the licenses today, but Alyssa has posted a link to Creative Commons. But I also, to really get the feedback and some trial and error of how to use these, again, I would recommend taking the State Board's course. So let's talk about, at the beginning, how getting the students involved. You really need to introduce this project early in the quarter, usually around week two is when I, at the beginning of week two is when I'm explaining to the students that they're going to be developing a project, and I ask the student to write the proposal. I, I know that these kind of projects take extra work. It's not the same time commitment as when students are going to maybe take a quiz that Canvas grades for us. So one of the ways to ease the load of that work is get the students as involved as possible. Sometimes the students get so inspired, they suggest something they're not going to be able to get done in the quarter. So by seeing what their proposal is, I'm able to say, is this realistic for the time frame? Let's talk about how we can scaffold this down. But what is most magical about this is it gets the students focused on the learning objectives. When I was in school, especially in my uh, undergrad, I actually thought at the beginning of the semester I was supposed to get the book, read the book, memorize the book. And what was in the book is what I was supposed to get out of the course. Now, through instructional design training, I understand it's supposed to be the learning objectives. And we have this conversation with the students. It helps split their thinking. And they get focused on the learning objectives. And, talk, and I let them say, how, how do you think you could demonstrate this? And this gets them engaged on a level where they can really feel in tune with the assignment and motivated by the assignment. And of course, we have examples. And I always do have one assignment they can just do if someone is these are all optional. I have an assignment. I let the students know you have a deadline. Don't come to me after the deadline and say, that assignment didn't speak to me. But before the deadline, you can craft a project that's different from the assessment that's posted, and I have examples from future classes. So they have like a menu to choose from, including assignments they can create, which has really made the assignments that I offer to future sections more innovative and more creative. Again, we want to guide the students in a way that gets them more involved so it's not putting a tremendous amount of work onto us. And again, always putting the same quality matters principles in of giving them an, an assignment with the rubric. So they see rubrics in the class. They see guides for what a rubric should look like. And then I ask them to write the rubric that's going to go with their project. And again, we need to do this in week two because we need time for them to provide feedback and then me have time to give them revision. But if, if we've done this work at the beginning where they've designed the project and they've designed the, the rubric and I've given them feedback, it really makes the grading process a lot more seamless. And these innovative assignments are a lot more fun to grade. So 
it's doing the work on the front end helps with the work on at the end of the quarter. I also recommend that you st motivate students by giving them multiple ways to show off their work. At Tacoma Community College, we have an event we do at the end of each quarter called Celebrate Learning. It's kind of like a fair. Classes set up with like a booth per class, and students come and show off what they've been doing. It's become one of our most popular events on campus, and it has multiple ways that it helps out in the classroom. For one, students seem to be more motivated when they feel like others are going to be seeing their work. They put a little extra work into it, knowing that it's not just going to be seen by the teacher. It also helps for you know, because when we have Celebrate Learning, students are still sometimes registering for future quarters. An introductory student that's the first person in their family to go to college might not know what an anthropology class is or even a humanities class. But coming to the Celebrate Learning event, they get to see what goes on in that class, so they're less intimidated about showing up. And they get to meet teachers and get to put a, a personality with the person they see on the registration. So it's just another way to help motivate and engage the student. So this is an example from a communication class. We have, in the introduction to communication class, we have objectives that are around conflict resolution, nonverbal communication, listening. These are things that we can talk about in the classroom, but they really are taught better outside of the classroom. So after the first two weeks of class, this was a summer class, we actually went out into the community. One of our English professors, Mary Fox, founded a nonprofit called Ride It 253 that does after school tutoring help in several neighborhoods in Tacoma. One of them is the Salishan neighborhood. The Salishan neighborhood in Tacoma is one of our most diverse communities, and they have a, a beautiful new community center the city has built, and students show up on Wednesdays or Thursdays and food is provided, and Ride It 253 has volunteers that come do lessons in the summer. So some of the students chose helping out in Salishan as their project. This particular group decided that they were going to help out in the background, where we had some students that were teaching lessons. The students in this group recognized that there were sometimes 70 students showing up, and the student group from the class teaching the lesson, maybe four or five students. So they realized some more one-on-one -on -one help in the background of the lesson could help. Then they started hearing from the families, you know, it's time for back to school, and that means back to school supplies, and that can be a strain on some families. So they had the students put together posters, and then they stood in front of Walmart on Union Street, and the community was very receptive. Uh, you, we had four carts donated of school supplies, and you can pause and think, this is not an assignment I would have required. This is not something I would have written up and said, this is what you have to do. But the student, by the students doing it, and we talked about the measure of success is not what's donated, and they soon learned, uh, and we'll talk about the, their measure of success. So the students went back to Salishan and passed out the backpacks to, and every single child in the Salishan community got a backpack with their school supplies with an extra $250 that went to the school. But where the real magic happened as far as our learning objectives was when the students came back afterward and made a video tying together what they learned to the learning objectives. The students were very open that they had built their community with themselves and with me and talked about lessons like on nonverbal communication. They caught themselves making prejudgments as people were walking up in the parking lot based on their dress, maybe how many tattoos they had, a judgment on which race they belonged to. The students caught themselves subconsciously guessing how much people were going to donate and then realizing the bias and the prejudices that they were putting into it and all of that is learning objectives of the class. And I feel like they learned so much more by doing this project out in the community and applying what they had learned than if we were just talking in class, maybe writing a paper and doing a quiz. And future students are, be able to, are able to learn from what they shared in their video. So then two of the students in this group that you see on the outside edges 
on the left, Yuki Sokolo, and on the right, Sandy Langford. They decided then that they were going to sign up for the public speaking course. And in the public speaking course, I had an assignment that students were struggling with. My instructions were about, if you took them out of Canvas, there were many pages. <laughs> and I felt like the students weren't really reading all of the instructions. The students were making some of those same mistakes over and over. And Sandy was struggling with speaking in front of an audience. And I knew she had felt comfortable in the video in the class before. So I gave her the option. I said, would you prefer to do your demonstration speech again with the video production, our multimedia production crew? I, I was very careful to let her know that it was an option. This was not something she had to do. But it was definitely something that would be useful for students. I feel comfortable with the assignment that they were demonstrating because we provide all of the resources for students, but they are spread across campus in three different locations. So Sandy took me up on the idea. Her and Yuki explained the video. So instead of doing a traditional demonstration speech in front of the class, they were demonstrating how to do the assignment. So we don't have time to watch all the videos today, but I put the URLs into the slides so that you'd be able to watch them later. And of course, we also want the students to be mindful of accessibility and provide captions in the videos. A byproduct of this is Yuki and Sandy designed an additional assignment in that class that actually won an information literacy board from our library. So Sandy just got engaged on such a deeper level. And we, she came back. She just graduated with her bachelor degree this week. And I'm so excited. And she came back and did a video for us with the multimedia production crew talking about her point of view so you can hear straight from Sandy and Sandy's words. And again, we've got the link for you so you can watch it later so you can hear from Sandy more on how she was engaged. Going back to the quality matters that we'll put in here, to make these assignments really work, you want to make sure that your students know about what resources you have on campus. We have a, a really nice multimedia crew that the students really enjoy engaging with, but you've got to make sure they know that they're there. But as I've been visiting around the state, talking to other colleges, I know other colleges often have these resources also, but you do want to make sure new students know about them. Some other examples, this is the amazing Dr. Phil Venditti at Clover Park Technical School, who really got me started in my OER journey. Phil did a, a similar, really creative, open UDL project where his st students in public speaking, we often think of public speaking as being the person that's talking to the audience. We don't think as much about interviewing, but Phil and I both put interviewing in the class. And his students put together an entire website called 50 White Speakers. Phil did a lot of the interviews on his sabbatical. Then the students in his class, who are also multimedia students, put the videos together on a web page, provided captions and transcripts, and re-edited the videos. So like in this question section, the second one from the left, instead of watching all the videos, they may be like if, if the fear of public speaking is the part you're having a problem with, they re-edited those parts of the videos. This was completely done by the students. And I think uh, with a, a very low tech budget, even though we're blessed to have fancy video equipment, they did this project with a $200 camera. So you don't have to have a huge budget to be able to pull off these projects. Another example from a communication course that we provided the link so that you can watch later, David Turley is one of our veteran students. David, it became time in the class for the persuasive speech. David heard about a need in the community and how our camp wanted to help our campus get involved, but the people who were doing this fundraiser didn't have a website, they didn't have any social media, the word was not getting out there. So as a communication student, David said, I want to help get the word out. And you can hear the full story in the video. It's, it's a really powerful story about what they made happen. And again, it's just engaging him on another level because he knows the project means something. It not only meant something for that fundraiser and helped the community in a big way, it also has, for me now, I have this really great example of a persuasive speech. 
So when a student says, as I just got an email this week, can you show me another example of a really great persuasive speech? I was able to say, yes, I can. Some of our students are blessed to be in multiple OER classes at the same time with teachers that went through our UDL cohort. Joanne Eller was in my class the same time she was taking Mike Elmore's political science class. And Mike was doing a really innovative project where the students or their papers became content for the future sections. So at, when Mike and I started our OER journey, years ago, there was not as much content available as there is today. The field of OER has grown by leaps and bounds. At the time, we were finding holes and we needed to fill in the holes. So we engaged the students by inviting, not requiring, them to jump into this. And you can see from Joanne that she really became a lot more engaged when she felt like she was part of the process. It, it just engaged her on a whole other level. She mentions that she's more engaged and feels empowered. Being part of the process increases my desire to learn. So another couple of quotes from Joanne that really just stick out to me is she said that she thinks with open pedagogy, the learning process is far more powerful. But remember, without the UDL, you know, there wouldn't be the choice involved. So it's really a blend of the two in the courses she was experiencing. And she said, oh, I found out that I had more interest. I found that I retained more of the material. That's a really powerful statement. The material became more important to me. So I think these are powerful statements. So you can hear Joanne's whole story at openwall.org. She's one of the OER uh, stories that's featured. Mike Elmore is on there talking about what he did in the public speaking class. So really what we're talking about is going back to the UDL concept of being flexible providing alternative options for the students, getting them involved in the process, and what we have found is getting them involved in the process causes them to be more engaged in the process and in their learning. So at this time, I want to open it up for questions. Christy, I didn't see many comments go into the chat as you were speaking, so I'm not sure that we have anything to go back and revisit. But um, if anyone has a question or comment now, please go ahead and um, type that into the chat for us or raise your hand and we'll call on you and you can use your mic to verbally uh, ask your question to Christy. Looks like we've got a couple of people typing, so we'll wait for those to come in. Um, Shannon says, curious how you came up with multiple means of expression activities. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. So I guess in this sense, I'm defining it as them getting to choose how they're expressing what they're learned. So for instance, again, often I'm not having to come up with them. They're coming up with them. But one example is uh, I used to have students write a paper on nonverbal communication. I still feel like writing is very important and there's still a lot of writing in the class. But then I had a student who said, okay, what I would like to do in the nonverbal section, my wife owns a non my wife owns a dance studio. And the student had his own camera and he had his own experience of video editing. So he asked if he could get permission, we always talk about permission, and releases from the dancers and put together a film on nonverbal communication dance is nonverbal communication. So he, he was expressing what he learned about nonverbal communication in a very different way than writing the paper, but it was actually the student that came up with the idea. All right, Christy, we have another question for you. Um, it says, great ideas. What kind of multiple means of engagement have you used with the project assignments? And that's from Sajana Lewis. Again, I would say the way I'm defining it here is by giving them complete choice. None of the projects described today were required or even suggested. So I feel like they're engaged on another level because they were part of the process and they wrote the assignment.
Did that help? I think she's typing. She says, also, are there issues with using student work revealing student names when students submit work? And then she said, yes, thank you, that it did help. But that was her follow-up question. You bring up a very good point. Technically, when students share their work with a Creative Commons license, we do have permission to show it. And I'm very clear to make sure the students understand that part of Creative Commons licenses is that they're irrevocable. That being said, I worked in litigation before I came over to academia, and I feel most comfortable when all of the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So Candace Watkins, our librarian director, and Dr. Bowie and Shea at the State Board just helped us come up with a Creative Commons student release. So some people may say, it's, and it was shared out in the open wall listserv, and I could also feel free if you put your email address in the chat window, I can send it to you directly. A lot of collaboration from the State Attorney General's office, a lot of eyes looked at the release to make sure that it was on the up and up. And I feel like the release is going to be an extra added piece of insurance that the students gave us permission to share their work. And the students are also choosing which license. Great question. All right, so she did put her email address into the chat for you, Christy. And then I'm going to go back to um, a question Shannon posted. She said, what do you do if you have a student who can't come up with an idea? I do have an assignment posted. So there's, there's, the, there's usually an idea posted, and then I tell them, I explain to them how other students have done other things. But if they completely can't come up with something, there is an assignment there. It's always good to have a backup plan. <laughs> and a backup for the backup. <laughs> yeah, a backup for the backup. That's always good. All right. Do we actually? Oh, oh go ahead, Christy. No, go ahead. I want other people to feel free to share other ideas, and we could make this more collaborative, because I love learning from you, too. So if you have an idea, we invite you for an assignment. Um, go ahead and type that into the chat and share it with the group, and we can um, re visit those and discuss a few. I do have a question for you, Christy, and maybe Bo Young might need to help us out with us with it since she's here today. I'm curious, um, have you run into any problems with plagiarism? Because I'm assuming that if something is released, if student work is released as OER and they've been given permission to use it, um, is it still considered plagiarism if another student copied it? I've seen the opposite come true. So this is anecdotally. I, now that I'm in the instructional design side and we have more teachers across campus, we've built up, there are at least six teachers there asking me each quarter to come do a lesson on copyright and creative commons. We talk a lot about plagiarism. We do not talk very much about copyright. And what we found is in the classes where we talk to the students about copyright, then they start to respect copyright. When they think about their copyright, they respect the copyright of others, and plagiarism goes down. So for the most part, I feel like it adds a whole new layer that gets them to appreciate plagiarism on a different level when they think about it as copyright. And also, when you think about these assignments that they're designing, like the assignments we talked about today, someone couldn't copy. Really, I mean, I haven't seen someone take pieces of other people's work. They would, at a minimum, to stay legal with the Creative Commons license, they would have to cite the source. If you don't cite properly with Creative Commons, you go back into copyright violation, violation and plagiarism anyway. So they would still have to cite the work. Great, Christy. Thanks for sharing that. I think it's really interesting, um, your anecdotal um, example that you, you feel that they have more respect for the copyright um, once they're informed about it. So I, th I think that's fabulous. All right, looks like we have a um, comment in the chat. And I think this is an assignment idea. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. This is from Sajana. She says, I regularly assign job shadow and community event participation assignments with a paper and speech tied in. 
I've had past students come in to share what they did in the past quarters and take Q&A from my current students. Now um, my, my brain's percolating how to make it better. Thank you for sharing. Christy's that's, giving you a thumbs up in the chat. <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, last week I was at South Puget Sound Community College. We were talking about these alternative options and the dental program was talking about how they have an assignment where the students have been have to give a speech in front of the class. They break it into different cultural aspects, like the students have to do a speech just on dental hygiene for the elderly. So we brainstormed what if they went in the community and actually did that at a retirement center instead of like faking it in front of the class. I think it would engage the students on a whole other level and fill a need in the community. And that goes way back to what they, how David defines open pedagogy, David Wiley, something that gets out of the classroom, lives beyond the quarter, and provides value to the world. All right, Christy, I think we're to the end of comments, unless anyone um, has a question. I want to thank everyone again so much for staying inside this time. I know everyone's super busy. Thank you so much. So here's Christy's contact information. And it looks like we're going to end up just a little bit early today. I'm going to put Christy's email into the chat for you all so you can snag it from there. I hope everyone has a great rest of your quarter. Hey, Christy, could you advance the slides one for me, please? It's not working from my end. For some reason, I'm stuck just like you were earlier. I can go backwards, but not forward. I think it's shown the last slide. Is that it? Okay. All right. Well, I'll just close us out then um, by saying thank you again to a la carte for their captioning services. And um, if you have questions about Ignis, uh, feel free to contact me at any time. I'll get my contact information up here for you. I found my missing slides. Let's see. Okay. And um, we thank you for joining us today. And um, Christy, this was a fantastic close to the Ignis season. So um, much appreciated um, you joining us today and sharing all your wisdom with us. And thank you to the audience for attending. Um, I think it was uh, great all around. And um, just thanks again, everybody. And a reminder that all of our stuff is um, Creative Commons, and it will be posted for you on the ATL blog. So feel free to access it and share it. Thanks. Bye-bye.